You are probably going to be a very successful computer person. You're going to go through life thinking that girls don't like you because you're a nerd. And I want you to know from the bottom of my heart that that won't be true. It'll be because... And also, I like the fact that you're never loud. I just feel like the last thing, if you're an asshole, it, it should be almost the quietest thing that you're saying. You're an asshole. Hi, I'm Jack. This is Seen It. And this, well, this is a movie about people talking. That's pretty much the plot. We get a few different locations, some fun montages, but other than that, 100% pure dialogue. And what was your ownership share diluted down to? 0.03%. In some movies, this is boring, especially when it's just college kids talking. Let's gut the freaking nerd. But here, it feels like an action movie, especially in the first scene. I'd like the first scene of a movie to, to inform the audience as to how much they have to pay attention. That's David Fincher, and his opening scene has two characters, 118 shots, seven camera setups, 10 pages of dialogue. How many takes, Jesse? And we did it 99 times. And yet, it only goes for five minutes and 21 seconds. Of course I, I have to go study. You don't have to study. Why do you keep saying I don't have to study? Because you go to beat you. The basic rule of thumb is one script page usually equates to one minute of screen time. So that is quick, like really quick. There was going to be no improvisation. Which brings us to this guy. You can't do that with this kind of script. It's just a little too dense and language oriented. The Social Network's lightning fast dialogue no, isn't unusual for Aaron Sorkin. He's one of the snappiest writers in the industry. But pure speed isn't enough. You still got to keep the audience engaged with good camera work and editing and acting. You can't handle the truth! So how does Sorkin and Fincher make dialogue like this? And dating you is like dating a Stairmaster. Seem interesting. Don't kill the messenger, Leo. Oh, wow. In the West Wing, Aaron Sorkin's dialogue was jazzed up with these big sweeping camera moves. Choreography, yeah, yeah. blocking, staging, camera like operators like weaving through like actors that. and sets. There's a lot to visually compliment the conversation. Are you kidding me? But nice David Fincher likes to lock the camera down. So instead of frenetic movement, he sets up two cameras, calls action, and... We shot both of our coverage at the same time. Tilt up. You kind of have to do that with Sorkin's dialogue because there's a lot of overlap and it's happening really fast. Dual coverage means that instead of having to film one actor, break down the camera, lighting, sound, and set it up again for the reverse shot, Fincher captures both sides in the moment. What is it supposed to mean? Eric, the reason we're able to sit here and drink right now is because he used to sleep with the door guy. Simply put, it feels like a fluid conversation because it is. Want to get some food? On the flip side, these static profile shots don't look too flashy, but Fincher doesn't care. You could put on a steady cam and you could spin around that table and you could do a lot of stuff. But really, the important thing is to watch Jesse Eisenberg's face as he listens, because the listening is more than half of that conversation. Funnily enough, the biggest beneficiary of this coverage wasn't the actors, although they definitely had fun. And it was probably the greatest experience I've ever had as an actor up until that time. It was the editors who were provided the flexibility to make seamless cuts whenever they wanted. He not only you know gets his main two shot or close up mm. perfectly, if he's going to do 15 takes or how many takes to get that right one, he's also going to do the same thing with all his coverage. This is Kirk Baxter, yes. one of Finch's two editors on the movie. So we don't get cornered with having to use a certain angle because that's got the best performance. We're gonna, he's going to make sure he's got a great performance in every angle he's got. How much are your shares diluted? How much were his? Maintaining continuity in this way at this pace is super important if you want the viewer to keep up. So being able to cut between two concurrent setups of the same take adds realism to the conversation, highlights all of Finch's tiny little details. It's a joy in like this like massive accumulation of details. This is Angus Wall, the other editor on the movie. And I think he works that way. I mean, just look at the edges of the frame in any shot. And there are little Easter eggs, visual Easter eggs, that if you think about it, it may have some kind of weird meaning with the scene. I mean, it's. The level of detail is is pretty incredible. Speaking of detail, let's have a listen to the background of the scene. I can't do that. I was kidding. Yes, I got nothing wrong with the test. I appreciate that, but I have to go see. Come on, you don't have to study. For the most part, Fincher wanted this to feel like a real conversation in a real bar. He tried to create a sense of realism beyond what movies logistically warrant. He does this elsewhere in the movie too, with loud, almost indiscernible dialogue. Uh, I'm sorry, I was looking at the architecture. But unlike other movies where the sound mixing might confuse an audience, well, we better put out the before the bomb goes off, eh? Sorkin writes in dialogue to show that the characters can't hear, they don't know what's going on, any confusion, any stumbles. Do you ever think about that girl? What girl? 
and it feels like any conversation you've had in a loud room. And it's confusing and you're hearing other people talk and that's confusing too. And all that stuff kind of adds to the full experience of it. So these are real college students having real drinks and real conversations in the background. Okay, moving on. You have part of my attention, you have the minimum amount. Next is the framing. Like I said before, there's only seven different camera setups here. For reference, Panic Room's opening scene has 35 setups. Working elevator. So comparatively simple. Two are medium close-ups, two are close-ups, and the other three are wides or medium wides. But it's how quickly these are cut and where they're cut that makes a difference. He'll, he'll pretty much always do his wide take first. This is Kirk Baxter again. And then slowly move in. And you'll see as he moves in, he starts refining certain things as they get closer and closer. Mm -hmm. Like, let's watch this together. Yes, I could sing in an acapella group, but I can't Does that sing. mean you actually got nothing wrong? I could row crew or invent a $25 PC. Or you get into a final club? Or I get into a final club. Did you notice how the conversation basically resets on this cut here? Or you get into a final club? This is a Fincher trope, using close-ups sparingly to indicate when the conversation's shifting, either in subject or tone, and what is important to the characters. Like, here's a pretty famous Fincher example. Where'd you get it? It's a Christmas gift from my mother two years ago. He lingers on this close-up of the watch to show what brand it is, which makes this line even creepier. I'm not the Zodiac. And if I was, I certainly wouldn't tell you. Similarly, these two shots are close-ups because Fincher wants you to register the importance of what they're talking about. Or I get into a final clip. Because this triggers the Winklevi War, Facebook, and every ensuing conversation in the film. Tell me this isn't about me getting into the Phoenix. It's a big moment, so there's a cut. Then he reverts back to medium close-ups and the conversation recalibrates. You know, from a woman's perspective, sometimes not singing in an acapella group is a good thing. This is Fincher repeats this same trick again when a quick fight is resolved with this cut to a mid-shot. Should we get something to eat? Another close-up when Mark steers them back to finals clubs. So you can see why it's so important to get in. And then this final close-up. It'll be because you're an asshole. This is a big one because it sort of indicates Mark's ambivalence to the situation. All these other exchanges indicated that the moment was of equal importance to both characters. They both got close-up frames responding or arguing with the other. What? You asked me which one was the easiest to get into because you think that that's the one where I'll have the best chance. But here, it's Erica's final insult, her final words, and Mark doesn't get a close-up. Which means that Erica cares, but Mark doesn't. It's simple, subliminal editing, but it works. So the editors kept doing it. A billion dollars. I like to go into those close-ups first so I know where he's hunting and what he's aiming for. Interestingly, this exact moment, this exact line, repeats itself at the end of the movie with the final line. You're not an asshole, Mark. You're just trying so hard to be. However, here Mark gets his close-up. Unlike his conversation with Erica, the close-up indicates that he's finally willing to listen, but it's too late because he's already alienated all his friends. Your best friend is suing you for $600 million. I didn't know that, tell me more. Like I said, the actors are speaking incredibly quickly, but the cutting has to keep up and it also has to develop its own unique rhythm. And you're saying that I don't. Of course I'm not saying that, sir. I'm saying that. Really? It's not as easy as just cutting on each alternate line, though, because there's pauses and the characters are constantly talking over each other. In China, with Jimmy's IQ, the entire the Phoenix is the most diverse, the Fly Club. These are the multiple conversations happening at the same time. Mark's answering questions on delay. Erica is trying to trip him up. I didn't mean to be cryptic. Just the two people sitting in a bar, this is frantic. As Erica says, Maybe it's just sometimes you say two things at once, I'm not sure which one I'm supposed to be aiming at. But so, the editors have to choose when to balance action, like this. Okay, well, which is the easiest to get into? and reaction like this. Why would you ask me that? Here's Fincher again. Because he's so much of a responder. He's not the kind of actor who wants to take center stage. He wants to react. He's talking about Jesse Eisenberg's acting style and how this opening scene is so key to establishing the film. But it also sort of set up the movie and how the movie should be taken, that it was going to be about semi-important things and self-effacing and and that it was going to be about this kind of pace. So what is the pace? Well, it's fast, but the editing is intentionally inconsistent. The average shot length in this opening scene is only 2.7 seconds, but these oscillate between 0.14 and 7.2 seconds. The door guy, his name is Bobby. I have not slept with the door guy. The door guy is a friend of mine. But again, it works because it buys into the movie's emphasis on controlled chaos. As conversations are cut to emphasize the framing and dialogue at key moments. We're not dating anymore, I'm sorry. Is this a joke? No, it's not. You're breaking up with me? At the end of the day, there's a lot of things that make the social network a great movie. The acting, the soundtrack, 
soundtrack, the social commentary that rings more true today than it did then. You write your snide bullshit from a dark room because that's what the angry do nowadays. But a lot of this wouldn't be possible if Fincher and the editors hadn't worked so seamlessly together. It was actually really rewarding because it took about three weeks to cut the scene. So in closing, I'm Jack, this is Cena, thanks for watching, and here's the Oscar winning editors explaining their success a lot better than I can. This movie was great because it was obviously really dialogue heavy and you could go super deep into nuancing the performances. You know, which is because David shoots for a very specific thing and because he shoots a lot, you can actually achieve a really finite result. You can really make something as as close to perfect as it as, as it, you want as, it to as be. it can be. Yeah. We'll do the POV of the oh, door guy. But we're done with the dialogue really after yeah. tonight? Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah, I mean we're getting through it pretty fast. Oh good, okay, good. good.